Welcome back, everybody. It is another episode of Hollywood Purgatory, the podcast where Hollywood goes to get judged. I'm Jeffrey Harris with 411 Mania. On the other end of the line uh, is uh, Jay Snook of the Good Men Project. Say hi, Jay. Hello. How's it going? Great. Uh, so we have a very special show today. It's special because we just had a new movie come out this week, uh, Blade Runner 2049. Mm -hmm. So the movie's out. So that means Jay and I are no longer beholden to any NDAs or, or embargoes from Warner Brothers. We are now free and clear to talk about the movie. This is a spoiler cast, folks. So here there be spoilers. So this is your last warning to stop listening to us. We are going to do a deep dive into uh, Blade Runner 2049, perhaps a little bit of Blame Runner, but we are going to talk about story, plot, and major reveals, plot twists, and spoilers. So if that bothers you, this is your time to leave. Mm -hmm. So here we go. So, uh, Jay, before we dive into this, um, the first Blade Runner from 1982, mm -hmm. I would say arguably is one of the most influential, iconic sci-fi movies uh, of all of all time, mm. arguably, I would say it's one of the most influential sci-fi films of the last thirty years. Uh, would you agree with that? No, no, I wouldn't. Okay, you don't agree. Mm -mm. Would you agree that it's an iconic classic film? I don't know about that either. It's visually wow. good, but I'd probably go about as wow. far as that. Yeah. Go ahead. The reason being is for me the original Blade Runner was really slow. Kind of okay. boring in a lot of parts for me, confusing, and just, it was very visually good. It had a good score. Harrison Ford is good in it, but the story was really weak. It wasn't as, as it didn't make a lot of sense okay. to me what was happening. But you don't think the, 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 the aesthetics of the film, the style of the film, and sort of the concepts, you don't think any of those were influential to science fiction or, or cinema at all? Well, I'll say, like I said, the visuals were. The visuals were influential. Okay. The visuals for the old one were really, were good for its time. But I don't know. Just like the story itself was really kind of weak and confusing and okay. boring to me. It just was. Okay. So going back to Blade Runner. So you're not a big fan of the original Blade Runner, are you? Not really, no. Mm -mm. Hmm. Uh, but how do you feel about Ridley, director Ridley Scott, director of Alien, Gladiator, and star Harrison Ford? Uh, he's uh, Ridley Scott is hit or miss for me. He's done some good films. Don't get me wrong. He's done some films that are iconic that really stand out were really good. And Harrison Ford, the same thing. He's been in some really good things like Star Wars and things like that. But um, and of course, Indiana Jones and, you know, plenty of films like that. So he's not a bad actor. No, no, no. And I wouldn't even really bash Ridley Scott either. It's just something with the first Blade Runner for okay. me. Just like I, I remember watching. Like it going, what? It doesn't click with you, I guess. It just didn't make a lot of sense. Like, you know, like the ending went over my head. I didn't even get it. So when I had to explain it to me, I was like, oh, okay. So that's what, what just happened? Because I didn't even understand it. Okay. Before this yeah. movie came out, had you ever wanted to see what would happen with a follow-up to Blade Runner or a sequel to Blade Runner? I didn't really want there to be a sequel, no. Because, like, I just wasn't <laughs> impressed with the first one. So I, was, I didn't expect him to do it. And I was like, I don't, you know... So even when I heard about the sequel, I was like, oh, well, we'll see. It could be good. It could be bad. We'll see. Now, uh, before we really dive into this, so the reviews, uh, it's been getting great reviews. 89% mm -hmm. on Rotten Tomatoes, 86% uh, mm -hmm. audience score so far. That's 30, based off of 30,592 user ratings. But a critic um, score of 89%. Uh, that's based on a sampling of 233 reviewers. Mm -hmm. Some reviewers have been calling this film a modern masterpiece um, mm -hmm. and a worthy classic to the original. What do you think? Is this um, a modern I, masterpiece? I don't know. I will say that I liked it more than the first one. I will okay. say that. But I don't know if I'd say a modern masterpiece. I'm not sure, to be honest. Okay, so... I love the original movie. I love the the mood it creates, uh, the ambiance. I love this movie. Basically, defines cyberpunk cinema and just sort of combining those concepts of tech noir, film noir, into science fiction and doing it so well. And I think a lot of things we we like that came later were definitely inspired by Blade Runner. I think if you enjoy Christopher Nolan's films, he he um, 
uh, Blade Runner is definitely one of his biggest inspirations uh, for a lot of his work. You can see it, I think, in the Batman films mm -hmm. and Inception and others. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, if you like anime at all, I think Cowboy Bebop definitely ha uh, was definitely influenced uh, bl by Blade Runner. Um, now, if you recall, they, did you see any of the short films they made uh, in conjunction with Blade Runner 2049? I haven't had a chance to. So know. they did several short films. One was uh, about Dave Bautista's character, Sapper Morton. Another okay. one was about Neander Wallace. And another one was about the EMP blackout in 2022. And it was directed by Shinichiro Watanabe, the, the director behind Cowboy Bebop. Okay. So let's get into this film. Blade Runner 2049. It's a continuation of the story 30 years later. Mm -hmm. The first movie is set in Los Angeles in 2019 mm -hmm. and it's based on a novel by the late uh great sci-fi uh author philip k dick mm -hmm. uh also created uh um the original book for the man in the high castle which is now a hulu tv series so philip k dick was um he w he was a great science fiction author mm -hmm. the movie blade runner is qu of course very different from his book uh the term Blade Runner didn't even come from his book. It came from another, I think, book or screenplay by William S. Burroughs mm -hmm. um, that Ridley Scott bought the rights, the, the rights of the title to, but not the rights of the story. Um, mm -hmm. So Blade Runner was a term borrowed and used for the title and, uh, and story of the movie. But for this movie, it's 30 years later. Harrison Ford's character, Rick Deckard, uh, has gone missing. He was a Blade Runner who came out of retirement. Of course, he was hired to to uh, kill those off-world replicants mm -hmm. uh, who came to Earth because they wanted to extend their lifespans. Because mm -hmm. the old replicant maker Tyrell, um, they built those replicants with a four-year lifespan as a failsafe. Mm -hmm. So it's been thirty years later. And the Blade Runner unit has been restarted in Los Angeles. And the main character of this movie is Ryan Gosling, mm -hmm. who plays K. And what is the big twist about K, J? K, J. Well, um... What do we find out about him early in the movie? We find out about him... Well, it's hinted that uh, there, may be, he, there may be more to him than meets the eye, is what we find out. In the what do we find... This is a spoiler cast, Jay. What is... What is his secret? That he supposedly was born, he wasn't created. No. What is his secret? Say, what is K? K is a, Officer K is a Blade Runner, but what is, he, what is he actually? He's also a replicant, isn't he? He is a replicant. Yeah. K is a replicant, and in the universe of Blade Runner, replicants are bioengineered humans. They're artificial humans. Mm -hmm. Um basically made or created in a lab somewhere. And now the LAPD is using Blade Runners to retire. That basically means kill other replicants. And that's- Older replicants, older replicants, like right. S8 and back or something. The Nexus 8, the Nexus 8 models, which yeah, uh, yeah. is how he runs afoul of Dave Bautista's character. Mm -hmm. uh, Dave Bautista is Sapper Morton, who is an old Nexus 8 uh, model who mm -hmm. went into hiding mm -hmm. and he's been, he's hiding out on a protein farm all these years. Mm -hmm. K is sent to take him out basically. Mm -hmm. um, and there uh, in um, Sapper Morton's homestead, he finds a case. Mm -hmm. Now here's the other big spoiler. Officer K who is a replicant. He finds a case and the case holds uh, remains. Mm -hmm. The remains are for a replicant. Mm -hmm. And I think we, we know, I think it's pretty obvious who this replicant is, right, Jay? Who was the replicant? And, the, and yeah. the, who was, whose remains were in the case? It was obvious after a while. It was uh, Agatha, right? No, not name? Agatha. What was her was name? Sean Young's character in the original, Rachel. Rachel, that's what I meant. The love that's interest, meant. Harrison Ford, Rick Deckard's yeah, love yeah. interest in the original yeah, yeah. film. But that wasn't obvious right away, but over time you, it be, did become obvious. Right. So they find these remains, but I guess the shocking revelation about these remains is that Rachel's character had somehow 
um, conceived a child mm -hmm. and gave birth to a child and died yes. during childbirth. Yes. So this is pr like these are bioengineered, created humanoids. Mm -hmm. So they present this idea that replicants who are basically treated as slave labor mm -hmm. by humanity, mm -hmm. the idea the idea that they could reproduce is basically impossible. But somehow mm -hmm. this. Uh, Rachel in the original movie was an experimental replicant by the Tyrell Corporation. Mm -hmm. And apparently they unlocked some sort of secret on how they could conceive and, and rebirth. So I guess my question, what do you think of the idea that they presented in this film that a, a replicant character from the original was able to somehow conceive a child and reproduce? And those I think it was actually a pretty good idea. It made sense because... It seemed like in this movie, the replicants were evolving anyway. It right. seemed that way. From the last one, they were very kind of like just normal. They, like the two that tried to do some kind of evolving were, of course, shut down, you know, eventually. But in this one, it, like, you know, you could tell that the replicants had evolved over time. It's just in the 30 years, like even Dave Bautista's character, you could tell all he really wanted was to leave me the hell alone. Let me have a normal and life. And he looked older. Normal. So apparently these yeah. replicants... The Nexus 8 models were apparently built with um, unrestricted lifespans. Yeah. But Batista's character clearly looked older. Yes. So he, it. so these replicants, they can not only live longer uh, beyond four years, they can reproduce in to some level age like humans do, which is interesting. Yes, yes it was interesting. What did you think of um, Ryan Gosling as K and learning that he was? Um, a replicant so early in the movie i thought that it was kind of cool to figure out I, I i almost want to say i don't know if it was a huge shock to him to be a replicant because i want to say some part of him he, might knew he was a rep he knew he was a replicant from yeah, the start yeah. so i don't think it was actually for me a big reveal because i kind of knew if he was a blade runner he was probably a replicant just right. a good, good possibility so right. i wouldn't call that a huge reveal for me but i mean that was a secret they had kept from the audiences, you know, once they, uh, from when they first started marketing this film. Yeah, that's fair enough. That's true. But did you like the idea that Kay was a replicant and we knew from the start he was a replicant? Like the yeah. audience is, the audience is in on this. It's not really a secret because the audience is in on it from the mm -hmm. very beginning. Mm -hmm. It was a secret before we go into the movie to see yeah. it. But right off the bat, it's like, you're a replicant and you're hunting your own kind. And he's well yeah. aware of that. So what do yeah. you think of that idea and going going forth with that idea for the sequel? I thought it made sense because that's kind of what happened in the first one. But the difference was in the first one, he didn't know, right? He didn't know he was well, a replicant. The audience, right? The, right, but the audience doesn't really know until the, until the end of the director's cut, really. That was released yeah. Yeah. 10 years later. So that so that's why it made sense because you might as well follow the same formula. Hey, it's a replicant hunting replicants. So it made sense. The difference was he was um, not only did he know he was a replicant, but he was like not necessarily a slave, but he was at the same time. He's almost like a servant, where it's like, hey, you go do this. I tell you to do this, you do this. That's the but, but is there a version of the original that you were that you like to watch, or you're basing this on? Because there are multiple versions. I did. I didn't see the director's cut. I just saw the original cut. That's the, the one theatrical. I'm basing this on. What the theatrical cut? Yes. Okay. So the theatrical cut, apparently the mystery is not as it, it's, it's apparently it's not obvious, but it's, it's highly more suggested that he's a replicant in the director's cut. Okay. In the theatrical cut. It's not as. It's not really at all. I didn't click on it at I, all. I wouldn't say it's not at all because look, even still, they're still trying to maintain some level of mystery to that question. Like Harrison Ford likes to say that he's a human. Ridley Scott says he's a replicant. Yeah. So but I'm and, just saying when I saw, the, I'm just saying when I thought the right. actual leak though, it wasn't obvious to me at all. Even no, at the no. ending, it didn't click in me at all. I didn't. No, get I don't it. think. I don't think it. I, I. I don't think it was. I don't think it really became a thing until the director's cut. Mm -hmm. That got that start that got released in 1992, mm -hmm. and then they they kept re-releasing the movie with like the final cut in like 2007. Mm -hmm. They released like so there are multiple editions of the movie, mm -hmm. and the later editions basically reinforce the idea that that um, Rick Deckard is a replicant. But going back to this movie, 
I like that K that K is a replicant, and we know mm-hmm. right off the bat. Honestly, it I made feel sense. like it really did. It right. Made sense. I think it made sense because I feel if you did the same thing as the original, it wouldn't have worked. If we would have been guessing the whole movie, yeah. oh, is he a replicant or not? Yeah, I, I agree. I, I, I think you have. I think whenever you do a sequel like this, you, it's difficult. I think it's difficult, mm-hmm. and I think it's better they didn't play it the same way as the original. Yeah, I, I agree. I agree. Uh, so, Rachel Sean Young's character from the first movie apparently gave birth to a child. She Mm -hmm. was a replicant, gave birth to a replicant child. Mm -hmm. Um, So Case Superior, who's Lieutenant Joshi, played by Robin Wright, Mm -hmm. she wants him to erase erase the child. He, uh, or whoever the child, you know, it's been 30 years. So the child's Mm -hmm. probably a full grown adult, if that's even possible. Mm -hmm. Uh, So the LAPD wants this cleaned up, swept under the rug and erased. So Mm -hmm. no one ever finds out Mm because they're worried if the whole world finds out about this, it could lead to a war between replicants and humans. Mm -hmm. Now there's another interested party, Neander Wallace played by Jared Leto. He's basically the successor to the Tyrell corporation from the first movie. Mm -hmm. Tyrell is Tyrell, uh, Marcus Tyrell and Tyrell corporation. They created the replicants. Mm -hmm. They created Sean Young's character, Rachel. Mm -hmm. And the new replicants are made by Neander Wallace, uh, Jared Leto's character. Mm-hmm. He wants the child found because he wants to. He believes humanities need the replicants as slave labor to conquer the stars. Mm-hmm. Basically, Neander Wallace, I thought was the worst part of the movie. And I'm not mm-hmm. like a Jared Leto ha- hater or anything, but I didn't like the character. I didn't like the Wallace subplot at all. And I thought it was undercooked. What did you think of Jared Leto and Neander Wallace and all those elements? Well, let's see. Um, I, I, I partly agree with you. Partly, I thought that it wasn't a bad touch because you got to see it. Because I think he wanted more than that. Didn't he want them to evolve? He wanted it to ha- them to have children and they couldn't? Yes, he wanted them. But he wanted he wanted them as slave labor. He basically, that's what he wanted. I thought I caught something different than that. It seemed like he wanted them to uh evolve well, said, and start when having did, their own kids, lose, right? he was talking about when did we lose our stomach for slaves and you know i can only make so many replicants so basically the way i took it is he wants replicants to reproduce um to to to, to reproduce more because he does not have enough to suit his goals he wants he wants to use replicants as his slaves to I guess conquer more on un- un- um you know call off world colonies because that's a thing in this in this universe, right? Okay. In the universe of Blade Runner, they're going off world and they're and they're establishing human colonies on other planets. That's what I think he wanted. And to me it, it's sort of like, you know, a slave owner wanting slaves to reproduce to have more slaves to work on his plantation. Mm-hmm. That kind of thing. I think I, I, I saw something entirely different. It seemed like to me with his character, he wanted them to start having their own kids so they could evolve because he couldn't evolve into any what? further. He couldn't do it. He wanted to make them where they could have kids and it wasn't possible. He, he kills that one replicant because he's like, you know what? You have this part here that's just worthless and I, I, I want you guys to be able to be like reproducing. Yeah, well, yeah but he wants, them to re- he wants them to reproduce for his company so he can use them. He doesn't care about the... Re- replicants other than that he needs them to do his work okay. that's what he wants okay so but i will agree though that he didn't always help the movie there were moments where he kind of dragged okay. it down at times but there and was he's barely even in the movie he, he only has two scenes in the movie but i like the scene there was a scene later that we'll get into that i liked but right. like there were some scenes where he came in because it was weird he couldn't see but he had like the little like robot flying things he, i guess right good, so that was a little weird He's, right i thought th- that i thought was an interesting concept so basically what we're talking about uh neander wallace his character is blind but he has like this implant he puts it in his neck so he can he can put a chip in his neck so i guess he has these floating drone cameras that kind of record and i guess they send all those images straight to his head i guess that i'm I, not sure i thought like, that was interesting honestly 
And then I mean, his his little robot, like you know, assistant assassin is was okay. So, Sylvia Hoyts, who played uh, Love, I thought she was great. On I love that character. She was good at moments, but toward the end, she kind of got a little bit weirder. I liked okay. her before, before, but you know, we'll get into that. I more. liked. I thought, as far as the villains went, I thought she was the most one of the more interesting characters in the film, personally. Mm -hmm. But what did you think of of Love? I thought that she was good at first, but when she tried to be an assassin, it was kind of weird to me. I thought it was it was okay, but okay. I kind of liked her better. I, I don't get like how is she just able to walk into LAPD HQ on two separate occasions, murder people, and just walk out with and no one and like without a without a problem. Yeah, she must have. I don't know. It was that. Like, like it was nice when she was like somebody she was trying to help at first, but after a while, she, she okay, was not I'm trying to help. She was not trying to help. I think you're misreading things. No, no, no. What I mean is when she took him downstairs to like that basement and right, wanted okay. to be forever and showed him the little thing, like, you know, the, like the little orb that was. Right. When like, Kay was investigating, he was, Kay was investigating yeah. the, um, the origin of the, of rep of Rachel's remains. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And, um, because uh, for those who don't understand the reason he went there, Rachel was built by Tyrell. But Tyrell was absorbed by ne Neander Wallace's uh, company, and he's he basically took up shop in Tyrell's old building in the new movie. Mm -hmm. um, so all of Rachel's records were were technically at uh, Neander Wallace's building, which was formerly the Tyrell Corporation. Mm -hmm. uh, I liked uh, I liked those scenes where he goes um, to to Wallace's building and he's mm -hmm. investigating. I thought those were some of the more interesting parts of the movie, and um, those sets looked really good. Mm -hmm. What did you think? I guess what did you think of uh, visually how 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 the movie looked, uh, production design, special effects, and everything? Those were actually really good. I actually liked them better than the first film. I thought okay. they were better, and maybe it's because the special effects have made more leaps and bounds than then. Maybe yeah. like yeah. there were still the plenty of the dark moments, but there were some lighter moments too that was kind of cool that I liked. Right. And um, I think even the city looked a bit better than the last one, to be honest. Well. Obviously, the big difference is the leaps in uh, computer-generated imagery. Yeah. The original, like, all of that is, like, uh, matte paintings mm -hmm. and, and miniatures. Like, mm -hmm. um, the sets in, uh, in, in the vehicles in the original would be, like, mo scale models that mm -hmm. were actually built by hand. Mm -hmm. And you can posit all those images together. Now yeah. everything's done, you know, by computer. Mm -hmm. um, I, I thought this movie. I, I liked the overall look of the movie, and I liked. I did um, too. Um, Roger Deakins, great cinematography. I think great lighting. Would you? Yeah, agree? yeah, yeah. I, th I like the visuals a lot more in this, and they are much better. And there was more of a contrast in them. It wasn't just all like you know dark, dark, and dark right. some more. I mean, so the contrast is better. And I have to say, I think the score was a little bit better too. I mean, like. And again, that's probably because leaps and bounds, but like it, it didn't seem as like odd as the score in the first one. So I like the score better too. So I want to I want to look something up about the score. I believe Vangelis did the music for this one. Mm -hmm. Just something I wanted to see. Mm -hmm. So uh, okay, so the music in this film was Hans Zimmer and Benjamin Wallfish. Using some of the Blade Runner themes composed by, okay, so the original, the music was composed by Vangelis, mm -hmm. and they used some of the same themes, um, but Vangelis did not do the music for this movie. Uh, the music was that kind of like really like moody, atmospheric, um, techno kind of techno sound. I think it fit the, the, the mood and ambiance of the film mm -hmm. very well. What did you think of the score? Yeah, I agree. I think it fit it better. There was a few times it was a little annoying at first, but it, yeah. it never was as it was as bad as the last one. It was definitely I enjoy it better, and it fit the scenes better, and things like that. Yeah, in terms of contrast, I, I liked you know sometimes he'd be in in the city, but then he went on those jaunts, like he went to the the he went to the waste <laughs> San Diego's a wasteland. Yeah. So if you like San Diego, folks, well, twenty forty nine, it's 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 a gar it's a landfill. How did you like Sandy when we saw San Diego? And it's just it's just a landfill for miles. Yeah, that was an interesting twist. I thought that was kind of interesting to see. Uh, the future is not bright for humanity in this film, is it, Jay? Not really, no. It's it's, it's a dump. It's and let's it's, talk about that for a minute because what I yeah. actually really liked about this movie was. Yeah. 
you got to see more of this world. You didn't right. get to see as much of this world in Blade Runner. And this one, you saw a lot more of the world, some of the right. cities, the, the the situations and things we're in. We get out and, of Los Angeles. We get out of Los Angeles. Yeah. So this, you got to see more of the world of this future that you didn't in the last one. So I like that. I liked, but I liked that we, he went to that sort of landfill area to look for the orphanage. Remember. Mm -hmm. uh, to find information records uh, because he found records about uh, orphans possibly connected to the replicant child. Mm -hmm. uh, but first he goes to San Diego and it's pretty much a wasteland and, it, and mm -hmm. it's just it's like a it's like a, a no it's like a post-apocalyptic no man's land but it's like it's just one giant landfill and it's de it's kind of depressing. <laughs> uh, what did you I mean what did you think of just that whole area being like a landfill. And then we saw those kind of like satellite dishes, which mm -hmm. kind of like house the orphanage. I thought it was actually kind of interesting because when he goes there, it's not barren. That's for sure. There's a lot of people there. there are, yeah. There are scavengers who try to attack him. Yeah. And not only that, but, in, but with that scene and with this film, you can tell people weren't like, yay replicants. They're like, you know, like there were a lot of people just like straight up, like, we don't like you at all. Okay. We don't like you. You suck. You need to go away, and and a lot of the scavengers are the same way. They wanted to take him down and kill him. Right. It's like we don't like you for a second. Yeah, like there was that, you are. Like at, when when we see him at the LAPD office, mm -hmm. we know he's a replicant, and he's treated he's treated like garbage. Like one of the other officers just mm -hmm. comes uh just comes up to me, and he's like uh he's like f off skin job. And basically, in the world of Blade Runner, skin job is basically like calling someone the n word. It's like the replicant equivalent of the M word. Yeah. Which we won't say here, mm -hmm. uh, by the way. And then um, when he goes to when he goes to that wasteland area, mm -hmm. um, scavengers try to shoot him down, and I guess scavenges vehicle for parts and everything. Mm -hmm. And listen, they want to kill him too. Listen, they want him dead too. Well, pro like. pro probably. I, I think they just. I think they wanted his car and his gear more than anything. Mm -hmm. Um. Another great location was Las Vegas, and Las Vegas, mm -hmm. I think the impression was uh, that it, that was Las Vegas after it was hit by like a dirty bomb or like mm -hmm. a nuclear blast or something. That nuclear was really, blast, I think, yes. yeah, so that was another, uh, to get to see Las Vegas in this world was all, and to see, the, I guess, the, what, what's left of Las Vegas mm -hmm. in this world was pretty interesting too. How did you like getting to see the, the post-apocalyptic Vegas? I like to see it because it was basically like just like a, like you couldn't go in there. If you went in there, you're going to die. I mean, like, so it was cool to get it. It was kind of in a weird way, sort of a throwback to the newer Total Recall because it was, a, like, you know, it ended up being a hideaway. And the, and the same thing was in the new Total Recall. They used like a, like a, you know, toxic zone to hide. Right. So it was kind of cool where they did that. I like that. Right. I, I thought when, once he went in there and I like that. Because that location, it didn't look like anything else in the movie, right? And it had yeah. that orange, it had that orange haze. And I like that they, in this movie, I think they did switch up the colors a little more, don't you think? They did. I agree. They totally did. And I and, and I like getting, like, I like movies that look beautiful and pristine, but I like it when, when they can change. I don't like it if, it if it stays just like one shade of color. Mm -hmm. You'll see that in movies. Like, do you remember Minority Report? Yes. Like, do you remember how, like, through the whole movie, it's in, like, that blue kind of, like, haze? There's a lot of parts where it is, yes. Yeah. This movie, I don't feel like it, it, it stayed, like, one color the whole time. I feel they, they changed it up from time to time. It definitely did. You're right. They did. Uh, so, so Kay is – he's going on this event investigation. Mm -hmm. And as he goes deeper into it, I think he starts to suspect – uh, based on a memory fragment he has that he mm -hmm. could be this dead replicant's child. Mm -hmm. And his search eventually leads him to Las Vegas where he finds da -da -da, Rick Deckard from mm -hmm. the first movie. He's back and noticeably older, but apparently he could still be a replicant because apparently some replicants can age mm -hmm. and have unrestricted lifespans. If you believe he's, he's a replicant, mm -hmm. and he's trying to find out from Harrison Ford about what happened to the child he had with Sean Young, who was his mm -hmm. love interest in the first movie. Sean Young played Rachel. So they had a child together, and they went into hiding, basically. Mm -hmm. I thought it was interesting. I thought it was interesting. 
go ahead. I thought it was an interesting twist too, where I thought they'd be allies right away. They weren't. Like yeah. Harrison Ford was like, "Yeah, I don't like you here. You need to go away. I'll kill you, and I don't care." He tried you know, to so kill. That him. was an interesting twist. He tried to kill him. Yeah, so I was expecting, like you know, from the trailers that they were going to be allies and help each other and like great buddies, and that's not what happened at all. <laughs> uh, how did you like? We did get to see them fight it out a little bit in that casino, <laughs> and it seems it seemed all they needed was a little Elvis music to calm down. Mm -hmm. What was kind of funny though was, and Harrison Ford has done this late, like where you know he was fighting. But you could tell he was like no match for me. Like, hey, you're a lot younger than me. So I can try to fight you and try to kill you, but you know what? You're just younger and stronger. And he's done the same thing in the new era, Indiana Jones. He did it in like, you know, uh, Star Wars Episode Seven. So like his characters now are like, hey, I'm older. I'm not a young 20 something anymore. So <laughs> well, well that was kind of a little twist. I like that he still had this. I don't know if you noticed, but his blaster gun, he still had the same one from the first movie. I like that. I didn't the, notice that, but it was kind of cool. I like I like that he's still, uh, all these years later, he still has, has his famous mm -hmm. blaster gun. Uh, if you ever have time, I w uh, do you know Adam Savage uh, from Mythbusters and Tested? Yes. He's done a lot of cool videos about uh, the Blade Runner blaster, if you ever have time. it's uh, yeah. If you enjoy, like, movie prop trivia, it's that kind of thing. Okay. And so eventually... Harrison Ford reveals that he, they all went into hiding. He went into hiding. Sean Young's Rachel went into hiding and he helped scramble the records. Mm -hmm. So no one would ever find out this child existed. Mm -hmm. Now, Kay thinks he's the child because he has this memory mm -hmm. um, of having a wooden, a carved wooden horse mm -hmm. that has a date on it. And that date, was found where the where where Rachel's remains were kept, and we all believe that date is the day the child was born, mm -hmm. um, like six ten twenty one or something. So Kay mm -hmm. has it in his head mm -hmm. that he is this child. So it's not, is he a replicant or not? Am I am I the child of Harrison Ford? How did you like the way that conflict played out over the course of the film? Well, I will say that. It was kind of annoying at first because it seemed so obvious. Like, even long before they said it, I was like, I know, oh, yeah, he's going to be the child. I, and so I didn't like that for, I, yeah, we'll get there. But I didn't like that at first for a while because, like, it seemed so obvious. You're like, man, Ridley, are you really going to do that? Just make it so obvious that, hey, he's the well, child Ridley of this direct, movie, right? Ridley didn't, we can't really put this on Ridley's feet like Alien Covenant because he didn't yeah. direct this movie. This one was directed by uh, Denis uh, Villeneuve. Uh, it was written by Hampton Fancher, who okay. who wrote he wrote the original, and he co-wrote it with uh, m I believe Michael Green, who wrote uh, Logan. Okay, so so anyways, so I was annoyed at first. It seemed so obvious. Yeah, but um, it was it wasn't a it would it did help the film though because it it eventually made sense to bring Deckard and. It was kind of interesting to me where it Deckard came so much later than I thought he would. I thought he'd be in the movie much earlier than he would just I, by again I, by the trailer. So it was interesting. Like, man, it actually took a good minute for you to finally see Deckard. And again, when you did, it wasn't the Deckard you expected. And it was interesting for a while because it seemed like, hey, you know, Kay and Deckard could, you know, have this bond. They just don't know they have, right? So it was, it did help the film. It was good for the film. It was a good, like, you know, storyline for the film and it kind of gave you know there was there could have been some bond for these two guys who otherwise would have nothing else in common besides they're both Blade Runners so I thought that was good what was there enough of Harrison Ford in this movie for what you wanted I think so yeah I think it made sense like you know like because I think that it, it wasn't his been, movie you know yeah but it would have been weird if he had been in it bigger than he was because this time he wasn't the star he was in it Right. He was not the head honcho, you know, and if and it would have been like if he was or if he'd been more, Ryan Gosling would have been riding on his coattails. And I don't know if that would have helped this movie. much. Do you, do you think he had enough to do? Do you think his role in the film justified his appearance? I think so. Yeah, I okay. do. I personally do. Uh, so were you a fan of uh, of the movie Logan that came out this year? Yes, I, I actually liked it a lot. I was so, quite so I mean, I mean. This movie have one of the same writers as Logan. So do you kind of see those parallels a little bit? I do, yes, actually. Now, what do you think what do you think of the dystopic view of the future? They went like sort of expanding upon where the future because look, 
Blade Runner was made in not, in the ni- early 1980s, right? And they're Correct. so they created a view of the future based on where they like where they thought things could or might go in 1982. Mm-hmm. And it's 2019. Obviously, we're in 2017 and way off from what, you know, despite what people might say, we're way off from where things are in Blade Runner. Mm -hmm. But in this movie, they have to sort of continue where the future was in Blade Runner 30 years later. Mm -hmm. This is not 2049, and it's not our future in 2017. It's the future Mm -hmm. of of, um, 2019 in in the first Blade Runner. So Mm -hmm. how how do you like? What did you think of how they expanded on those ideas for this film? I think it was much better, and it was a necessary expansion because if they hadn't, I think it would have been more confusing to me than anything else. So it was a necessary expansion to do how they did it. What we, what were, were there any like uh, concepts of uh, sci-fi in the in this film you liked the most? Hmm. Well, um, it could be the- flying cars. Could be one flying cars with automatic weapons. Yeah, the flying cars was kind of cool. Um, I actually liked it. it was kind of cool where he had like the little like holographic girlfriend. That was kind of cool. That was and, my. I'm gonna tell. All right, so let's get in his girlfriend, uh, Ana de Armas. Yeah. Who play the character is called Joy. Mm-hmm. Is basically like it's basically like um, the 2049 version of Siri, is it not? Kind of. Yeah. Like like a holographic girlfriend, Siri. Called Joy, played by Anna Darmas, who's been in it. She's done a few movies. Um, do you know Knock Knock with Keanu Reeves? No. She was in that. She's done it. She's done a few things. Let me let me uh, read off some credits uh, for that character. Uh, but what did you think of? So basically, Kay, who's a replicant, mm-hmm. has created this idolized um, uh, artificial intelligence girlfriend named Joy, mm-hmm. played by uh, Anna Darmas. What did you think of that subplot? I thought it was kind of cool because it gave him a bit of a personality and humanity. Otherwise, yes. without her, that I, wouldn't have been there. And over time, you could tell she started to get a personality because she wasn't just this like simple, like, you know, I say yes to everything, make you feel good. She was became a bit more than that. So I thought that was kind of cool as the she, film progressed. She was also in Hands of Stone and, and War Dogs, if you've ever seen those films. Yeah, War Dogs was kind of weird, but I have seen that in Hands of Stone. They were yeah, both she was a, a love interest in War Dogs. I thought the most interesting part of this movie for me, uh-huh. the mo- this is bar none the most interesting part of the film. Um, at one point, like he takes um, Joy, he, he puts her in like a portable, like a portable uh, little like memory stick basically. Yeah. And removes her from her apartment, like her apartment console that he has in his apartment where mm-hmm. he keeps her memory bank. He puts mm-hmm. her memory bank in that little stick, remember? Mm-hmm. And he's like, you know, if I take you with me, like you'll be, you'll be vulnerable. And if anything happens to this, like you'll basically die. And, um, that, that memory stick, it gets destroyed. Mm -hmm. And then, and and then you see him remember when he's walking down like the bridge and and he Mm -hmm. sees that hologram Mm -hmm. and it's, it's joy. It's Mm -hmm. a billboard. It's basically an electronic billboard advertisement for the joy device that was created by Neander Wallace, by the way. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of like, you know, it's kind of like Steve Jobs creating the iPhone and all these kind of fancy gadgets that mm-hmm. everyone likes, you know? Mm-hmm. And what do you remember what that billboard said to him? It said something like, you, you look like a good Joe or something. Yeah, something like that. So think about that. What did the hologram, when, when Kay is having those existential crises, mm-hmm. crises, mm-hmm. crisis, whatever, mm-hmm. and he's talking to Joy, and Joy's like encouraging him about naming himself, not K, but like a real name. What does she want to call him? Joe. And then what does that billboard call him later? Yeah, Joe. Think about that. It's like, it's like that, it's like that artificial intelligence just has one name. Mm -hmm. You can name like, um, it's not, and on the other hand, I feel like even as much as Joy was evolving, I feel like everything we heard from her mm-hmm. was just Kay himself. Mm-hmm. It was just Kay telling himself what he wanted to hear. Mm-hmm. And I think that the implications of that, I think, are fascinating. 
Hmm. What do you think about that? What I just told you. I think you may be right. They could. They're, they're def they definitely add more depth to the characters and to the. There's story. so much depth there. Mm -hmm. And um, also, all the food. It looks like all the food people eat are like protein worms. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Which the future, uh, like humanity, does not seem to be in a good place at all in this movie, Jay. Mm -hmm. Um, basically, if anything, I feel like at points in the movie, the movie is basically having you root for, uh, the replicants to destroy humanity almost. Did you ever get that feeling at all? It did feel, it felt like that's what Wallace wanted at the time. It felt like that to me at the time. That's what he wanted. That's what it I don't felt think like that's what he, I don't think that's, I think he wanted to maintain, um, the, I think he wanted to maintain, uh, the status quo of humanity controlling the replicants as slaves. I believe that's what he wanted. Well, I know that's what you think, but what I think is that he wanted um, that, like you know, he wanted them to freaking rise up against the humans because he knew they were better than the humans anyway. That's how I saw it. So that's why I say he wanted to have them reproduce. I think if they could take over if they didn't have to be built anymore. They could take over. I think I think what he wanted was to take over other planets to have. And to have, and he wanted to control the replicants' reproduction himself, and and like sell it himself, so he could, I guess, con I think he wanted to control the course of humanity's future, because mm -hmm. the way this started out is uh, in this movie, or I guess before, right before this movie, some years before, humanity was facing a global famine, and he mm -hmm. created. Uh, like this, pr like this um, synthetic protein uh, to curb a global famine, and he and he became very rich as a result. And he bought out the Tyrell Corporation and helped uh, end uh, replicant prohibition. Mm -hmm. But I believe his goal was to colonize um, worlds that had pre like uh, new planets that humanity could inhabit eventually. Mm -hmm. um, because like the Earth is pretty much the the Earth looks like it's on its last legs here, doesn't it? Yeah, it does. It's pretty. It's a pretty sad and dreary movie at times. Wouldn't you agree? Well, it's not just that. It, the, it seems overpopulated too. So it looks at that too. It's overpopulated. It's overpopulated. You know, the cities are huge. Right. They've got an insane amount of gargantuan high buildings. There's and no food. There's basically no real food left. Everyone's yeah. eat. You're all. Everything you eat is like mm -hmm. artificial. So mm -hmm. think about that. Think about like all the things we take for granted, like fresh wa fresh water, mm. clean water, uh, fresh food, and 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 uh, you know, there are no animals left. Mm. There are no there are no real animals left, and there's like all the food you eat is synthetic. Mm. That would be pretty. That'd be a pretty sad place to live, wouldn't it? Mm -hmm. Now, now remember when he took that shower. And remember the shower voice is like this is ninety like ninety nine point five percent detoxified water. Mm -hmm. I mean, would you feel good like I'm about to have a, a sip of a sip of water? It's like this is ninety nine point five percent detoxified. Would you put it down or would you drink it? I'd put it down. <laughs> <laughs> Even if, just that point five percent of detoxification of yeah. detoxified water, that'd be too much for you, wouldn't it? Yeah. <laughs> uh, that I thought was another cool concept. Mm -hmm. And uh, okay, so he he meets up with Deckard, and basically Deckard then gets kidnapped by the Neander Wallace people, mm -hmm. and then um, Kay is injured. He is mm -hmm. saved by uh, some rebel replicants mm -hmm. who know about uh, Deckard's child and Rachel's child, mm -hmm. and they want. They want Kay to kill Deckard so the identity of their child will remain a secret. And this is where Kay learns that the child was a girl. Mm -hmm. Deckard and Rachel had a girl together, mm -hmm. and um, it was not Kay. And Kay's, Kay's kind of emotionally devastated that it wasn't mm -hmm. him. because. And then, and then uh, the rebel, I think her name is uh, Fre Freja. Uh, but you know, we all wanted it to be us. We all, you know, we all want it, I guess, basically saying we all want to be special mm -hmm. in some way. But, um, so Kay is basically told you have to kill Deckard to, so to get, 
to keep this secret and we're going to rise up against humanity. Mm-hmm. Now, here's where I believe this, this – look. Don't you think if Neander Wallace really supported the replicants and wanted them to rebel, he'd be working with those replicants? Mm-hmm. Fair enough. Fair enough. Okay. So that's that's – I mean, I can see where you're coming from, but those replicants were not friends of Wallace, and they wanted they wanted to create a revolution. Mm-hmm. Andrew Wallace wanted to steal that child uh, to use it for his own goals, which was not replicant superiority. Okay. So it almost, you know, what this kind of reminded me of it, it kind of almost reminded me of like sort of mutants and humans in the X Men universe, which yeah. you know parallels themes of prejudice and mm-hmm. racism. Uh, if you think about it. Yeah, I see that. I could see that. Uh, so when we found out, how, how, what was your reaction when you found out that Kay was not the child and that that was not his destiny? I thought it was a cool twist, and I thought that I, I was kind of thankful because I'm like, oh, good. So it was still a secret. And it wasn't what I expected it to be, so I didn't see it coming at all. So I thought that was kind of cool. Um, so basically, Kay... F- Kay realizes that it wasn't him mm-hmm. and the actual child who was a daughter was in fact another scientist. Mm-hmm. Um, and the scientist is actually uh, the person who creates fake memories mm-hmm. uh, for the replicants. You see mm-hmm. replicants are given fake memories and they're given fake memories to help, to help them appear more human and act more human. In the first movie, Tyrell talked about Sean Young getting the f- fake memories mm-hmm. as like an emo- he called I think he called them an emotional cushion so mm-hmm. they would be more human mm-hmm. than human and the, and the memory Kay had where he sees the horse in the orphanage and he's mm-hmm. he's chased by those kids that was the daughter's memory implant, implanted in his head what did you think mm-hmm. of that twist oh, that was a cool twist because it was it was interesting when you see him showing it to her, how emotional she's getting. It made sense when that, when that came into the light, you're like, Oh, that's what she's getting so emotional. Cause it was a bad memory of hers that she wants to probably forget anyway. Right. Right. Yeah, so that so, was, that, so, that, that was cool and gave more depth to her and made me kind of feel like more sympathy for her. I'm like, Oh, that explains. So the daughter is doc is uh, Carla jury who played Dr. Anna Staline. Mm-hmm. So when we, fu- when we first see her, all we know is that she's a scientist that, creates fake memories Mm -hmm. because in the world of blade runner you can be implanted with fake you know fake memories Mm -hmm. and she she's the one who designs them in her little lab and apparently she can't leave because of like a a genetic disorder Mm -hmm. Um, what did you think of that scene and when we learn about this character and did you have any idea that character would be so important later nope i had no idea i just knew that hey you know She's a part of the investigation. Uh, Kay wants to definitely like, has a good conversation with her, and she does a good job at her job, clearly. But yeah, the isolation and the fact that, like you know, uh, we we like we just knew so little about her. I had no idea she'd be so much bigger at the end. I had no idea. Uh, w- did you like the idea that she turned out to be the daughter of uh, Deckard and Rachel? Yeah, I thought that was great. I thought that was a, like, a really cool, and I saw it's like, oh, okay, that's really awesome. I like that. It, do you think that was the right play for for Kay to not be the child? Yeah, because like I said, it was if he was, it would have been too obvious. I would have been more annoyed. I'd have been like, you know what? God damn it! Because I'd be like, obvious. I don't like when a movie does that. To to it, it would have been way too predictable. So, yeah. um, it. I mean, I I figured I figured it wasn't Kay because when he found the records in the orphanage, I think he he found. There were like two, like there were two anomalies, and he figured one had to be a copy. Mm-hmm. And I figured, oh, the, uh, like, can't. oh, here's the other thing: the doctor uh, Anna, who who turned out to be the real child, she said something about memories. Real memories, you don't remember the details as well. Right? Remember, she okay. said. If it's a real memory, it won't be as detailed, but you'll remember the feelings. You'll remember how you felt. Okay. And it can't be real if you remember a horse with those numbers on it, right? Mm-hmm. That's way too detailed, I think. Mm-hmm. So I think that would be one way you could figure out the child wasn't K because he had because he had a horse and he was able to rem- – in this memory – he was able to specifically remember the horse having that inscription on it. 
Mm. And that's way too much detail for like a, a, a memory, basically, yeah. based on what the doctor said. Yeah. So it climaxes with this big fight where uh, Love uh, working for Neander Wallace, I guess they're trying to take uh, Deckard, uh, I, I think they're trying to take him off world and off of Earth. Mm -hmm. He's, uh, um, and then Kay comes in in his flying car. He shoots down the other um, uh, Neander Wallace uh, company cars, and uh, he shoots down the car with Deckard and uh, and Love. Uh, he gets into a big fight with Love, and they're over this dam, and it mm -hmm. and it's and the car sets down, but like the the water keeps flooding the car, and so he's he's fighting Love, who does shoot him. Mm -hmm. Kay is able. He's able to barely drown, uh, cause her to drown, kills Love, and he saves – he's able to save uh, Deckard, brings her to Dr. Anna Staline's, uh building where she lives and works. So um, – and he's going to say, we're going to say you died because the replicants basically wanted you dead to protect all their secrets. Mm -hmm. But I'm going to save your life so you can see your dog. Mm -hmm. So in his last act, the replicant K – Commits a, a totally unselfish act, all in the, all in the name of Deckard reuniting with his daughter that he's never, probably never even met. Um, so kind of uh, he K does die. He died, but he dies in peace, knowing that um, I saved I saved Deckard, and I was able to reunite him with my uh, with his daughter, no matter what. What did you think of the note? the movie ended on and ending on that moment where we see Kay dying, but, but Deckard does get to meet his daughter at long. Well, last. Let's talk about first where, you know, Kay gets stabbed, what, like two, three times. We believe he's dead. Right. And then he's like, you know, he saves Deckard and then you can see. I think he's first, well, I think the, when he's he in Vegas, see. he gets hit by shrapnel, right? He gets stabbed by something. Yeah, kind of, but he's got the bandages on his face and nose, which goes away any, image anyway, for whatever reason. But yeah, the he got hit in the – he got something in the torso. He got some okay. sort of shrapnel. He got and, and that gets patched up, but yeah. then he gets stabbed again in the fight with Love. And I like think – two or three he times. Shot, he shot and stabbed, I believe, yeah. yeah. And, and he's in, like, bad shape, but he's able to save Decker. Then, like, it's not till the very end where that's finally killing him, where it's like you think, you know – even well, if you're he's, a replicant, he's a replicant. He's even a, replicant. If you're a replicant, though. You would think, like, man, you're, you're in bad shape. You just are. You can tell you're in bad shape. Well, well a lot of – well, he – Replicants are built to withstand a lot of pain and um, a lot of pain and trauma. Remember, in the first movie, Leon, um, uh, uh, Deckard's superior, Bryant, said the only thing that can stop this guy is killing him, and even then, he wouldn't feel it. Mm -hmm. So, basically, replicants—they're built for combat. They're built to withstand. They're built to take damage um, because they, you know they're they're combat units, basically. Mm -hmm. And K is a Blade Runner, so he was built to be a Blade Runner. So he has to withstand. He has to be able to take a lot of punishment. But I feel like he found his humanity in the get. In the end, he found his humanity. Yeah, I agree. I agree. He did. I thought it was a little over dramatic of how he died because I almost wonder, well, will he die or won't he? He and, died. And the ending was okay. I mean, I, I think I would have liked to see a little bit more. Maybe her actually get out of there. Them go, them go find somewhere to live or something. So I thought it was an okay ending, but I thought it could have been better. Well, that's the thing. I, I, I think – I'm not sure what – it said she had to stay there because of her immune system, and apparently she couldn't go outside. Could, could, so that, be Elijah, if, could that be Elijah so she'd never be, leave? You know, that could be a lie yeah. just to keep her yeah. safe and just keep her isolated yeah. there. You're yeah. right. So Yeah, because I, I don't even know. Like Once you find out what she is, you wonder, well – was that just a lie? Was that ever actually I think, true? I think the dilemma is, is that the replicants want to use her, maybe they wanted to use her and Deckard almost as martyrs, mm -hmm. or maybe not necessarily mar martyrs, but tools as for their own revolution. And Deckard may not want that for her, you know? Maybe. He may maybe. not, he may just want to keep her safe. Yeah. The Wallace uh, Corporation wanted to use her to learn how replicants, probably dissector they probably wanted to dissect her and learn how yeah. replicants can reproduce 
Yeah, um, he said. Yeah, he, yeah, he said that. So that's true. Uh, Decker right? was afraid of that happening, where like the baby would get you know dissected and obviously part intestines. So would, yeah, yeah. So I feel, I feel K picked the option to help Deckard and uh, Anna mm -hmm. to to reunite and not and not really help either party. He didn't really he didn't really choose either party. He just chose. Deckard, I want you to see your daughter again. I want you to see Anna. And, and he put it in their hands, basically. And I thought that was rather sweet and such a bleak and depressing movie. Mm -hmm. and, and this was a depressing movie sometimes. To have, I think to have a moment like that, it was, pretty, it was bittersweet, and I liked it. I didn't really see this movie as depressing as the first one. I thought this wasn't as depressing. It had its moments that were kind of bleak, but... I wouldn't say this was a depressing film. No, I thought it was a little bit longer than it needed to be at some parts. Right. That's just me. But um, even though the ending wasn't perfect, it was definitely a better ending than the first one that I understood better. Like where the first one, when it ended, I was like, I didn't get what just happened with the guy with the weird little paper horses. I didn't get it. <laughs> or they're, they're called origami, and that actor's name is Edward James Olmos, and he's an Academy Award winner. So okay. have, just, more, I, I, I have more respect. It. <laughs> I'm just saying, I didn't get the ending of the first one. This is at least I understood, okay, you know, yeah, Kay's dead. Decker does get to see well, his daughter. We're right. not sure what's going to happen next, but, you know. At the end, the, the end of, the end of um, that movie, because remember the unicorn? Mm -hmm. The first movie? Yeah. The unicorn? It, it, it's meant to hint that um, Edward James Olmos' character, Gaff, knows what Harrison Ford dreams about, and uh -oh. it's meant to symbolize that Gaff knows that Deckard is a replicant, basically. Okay. That's, the, that's, the, that's the apparent hint. Or it could mean something totally different if you don't believe Deckard is a replicant. Now, what I did like, what it was really cool where they, we got to see that character in this one for a minute. I liked that yeah, when they did that. that was, the, yeah, we see him in like the retirement home. Yeah, I don't know if it was the same actor, but I thought it was Same actor. Cool. It Same was. actor, nice. Edward James Olmos. So it was like, that was a cool little cameo. I like that. That was cool. Right. I think I think he yeah. So Harrison Ford was in the movie. Um Edward James Olmos. And we do see Rachel from the first movie. Yeah, kind of. It was credited it was credited as Sean Young, but I don't even I don't know if that was really Sean Young with some CG. I don't know. It could have been. Yeah. With just with some CG makeup. Who knows? Yeah. Um because, I mean, look what they did with Michael Douglas in Ant-Man. Well, look Kurt what they did with... Um, uh, uh, in Guardians of the Galaxy. Yeah, I was going to say, Kurt Russell in Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 2, yeah. So so it's not impossible. It's not impossible to do that nowadays. Yeah, it's really not. Um, so, I, I guess, you mentioned the length. This movie was, with credits, it's about mm -hmm. two hours and 43 minutes. Mm -hmm. The first movie was not that long. Mm -hmm. Was this movie too long, uh, Jay? You know what? There was parts of this one that dragged on, but the first one dragged on a lot more for me. So I can't. It was. It seemed a little long at parts, but it was definitely didn't. It, it, the The story was the the plot, the story, the movie flowed better with this one, where it it didn't like like lull as often or drag on as often. Like when it did, you knew something was going to happen next. So it was definitely more action packed than the first one. That's for sure. So it's the first a lot movie, more action than the first one. So just by comparison, the first movie is under two hours. Okay. This movie is almost two hours and forty-five minutes. Mm -hmm. So they definitely made a, a a much longer movie here. Yeah. I think it maybe could have been ten to fifteen minutes shorter. I want to say maybe too, but I'm not sure what they'd cut to do that though, because most everything they had in this was important. Most of it was. I maybe not so much the scenes, but maybe they could have tightened. They could have tightened some things up a bit. Like what? Maybe shorten if shorten some of the maybe trim some of the scenes down. Like what bit. scenes? Scenes where where some of the shots go on really long. I think for a while they could have taken out a couple beats here and there. Mm -hmm. Maybe uh, some of the exploration type scenes where he's exploring around the wastelands or um, or Las Vegas. I don't know. Uh, that's that's hard for me to say because it seemed like. Most of everything they had in this movie was necessary to have in the movie. Like, like if they had cut oh, down, like, like, yeah, like if they had like cut the down Sinatra, the part they where cut, I think they could have cut the Sinatra scene. Really, I thought that was a good scene. I like that scene. Yeah, so but does know. the movie need it? You have to think about does the movie need it? Like, 
a lot of if you look at some good movies and you look at some of the deleted scenes they're good scenes but does the movie need you have to think about does the movie need those scenes yeah, that's true that's fair that's fair i feel like there wasn't enough of neander wallace in the movie for what he does i needed mm. i think because we are we are not like aligned with how we felt about neander wallace i mm. feel like they needed more scenes with him to establish his goals mm. i feel he was under underdone Maybe that might that might be right. I think you might be right there. I feel if we got a little more of Wallace, we'd see a little more of what he was about and what he was trying to do. Just because I feel like there's some confusion there. Yeah, fair enough. Uh, I give this movie honestly, though. I don't think the movie's a masterpiece. I think it's very yeah, good. Either. It's good. I think, I think it's it's got some decent acting. I think it looks great. I think mm -hmm. it's fairly well directed by uh, Denis uh, Villeneuve. Mm -hmm. Um, but do I think it's better than the original? No. Mm. Um, do I think it's a good movie? Yes. Mm. Do I think it's a classic or a masterpiece? Masterpiece? I don't think so, but we'll mm. see where, we'll see where attitudes on this film are. Sometimes it just takes time. Yeah. The original Blade Runner, uh, that came out in 1982, it bombed at the box office and, and critics were mixed on it. Mm -hmm. uh, Siskel and Ebert, you know Siskel and Ebert, the yes. famous film critics. They yes. didn't like. They didn't really care for. All they liked about Blade Runner were the visual effects. They didn't really like the movie. Uh, yeah. Yeah. That the original one that came out in 1982. So <laughs> it could take time uh, yeah. for this movie to get recognized as a yeah. classic. I, I agree. Like I think I actually personally did like this better than the first one. I just okay. did. And that's. It's, cool. it's I, got, I think that's totally cool. Yeah, it's got it's got better characters, okay. better story, better visuals. It's more action packed, so it doesn't like drag on at certain parts. They're like so that's really good. Um, it does have more action, yeah. And it just kind of overall told a better story, you know. Okay. And there were moments where you thought you had stuff figured out, then it turned it on its head and went, "No, this is actually what it is, not what you thought." Sorry. You know, um, the cameo for some of the characters from the previous one was kind of cool, so it kind of was a bit of a throwback to the original. Okay. But those weren't huge either. There are only a handful of them. Were, so if you hadn't seen the first movie, you wouldn't be confused seeing this one per se. Not necessarily, I don't think. Based on this movie, do you want to see another Blade Runner? Blade Runner 2050? I don't know. The problem is, it's almost like if they did another one, they'd need to wait a while again. So if they did an immediate sequel, I don't know if that would work. Because with this one, you could tell from the first one to this one that, yeah, things had gotten worse. It just had. So if you did another one where, hey, one year later, it's like, I'd be like, it wouldn't be the same movie. So I think if they were going to, um, I don't know if I'd, if another one would be a good idea, to be honest. But um, but I would say that this isn't a masterpiece either. I'm not sure. And I wouldn't say this was one of the, like, it was good, but it really didn't blow my mind. It wasn't like, oh my God, this is so good. I'm going to have to run out and see this now. It wasn't one of those movies for me, but it definitely was a movie where, at almost three hours, it didn't necessarily always feel like three hours. Has Sometimes there been a movie just... like that for you this year, though, at all? What do you mean? Like Get Out, Must See. Yeah, there's been a few. Like, na like name name a couple for me. Uh, Wonder Woman is one. Wonder Woman, I think, was so good. It was a must run out and see now. I really was surprised by that movie. I really was. Wonder Woman's a good choice, yeah. And, and it is one just because it's so good from the previous one in just so many ways. Even though it's not trying to be the previous one, I really was surprised by it. I really was. It, okay. And um, let's see. Um, it's a big one. A lot of Spider-Man Homecoming, Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 2, maybe? Spider-Man Homecoming, I'd say yes. It, it just okay. because of the fact that you got to see, like, you know, a different Peter Parker, basically. You know, where... He's 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 not he's he's on his own, but he isn't. He has the mentor with Tony Stark. That was kind of cool to see. And um, so those are at least a few. There's been a, a handful of films like this is a you must go see this now. But there's only a handful. But those are a few. Okay. So getting back into Blade Runner, the movie's not going to bomb at the box office this weekend. But some of the some of the later projections had it opening pretty big at like fifty one million. Yeah. Now it looks like it's going to finish between thirty one to thirty six. According, this is um from Box Office Mojo based on the Saturday uh, estimates. Okay. So it apparently like the, at first they thought it was going to be a lot bigger. Now it now it looks like it's going to be much smaller at about. 
31 uh, to 56 million. The budget of this movie, Deadline uh, said 170 million. I think you're not that bad. Uh, that's so that's. Uh, I mean, for a movie of that budget and for it to only open with 31 to 36 million, that's not. It's not doing so hot. So, what do you think about that? You know, I think that this film, because um, I've heard mostly positive stuff about it. Yeah. And there really isn't anything really big coming out for a couple weeks. There's still it, but I don't know if there's anything else really big coming out till November. I don't think. Nothing really big. There's stuff coming out, but I don't think anything's going to like you know be as big as this until November. I don't think. I could be wrong. Uh, well, we have Thor Ragnarok coming out, which is November. So that's November. So uh, I don't know if there's anything really big coming out till that. I, I mean, really a, big. Uh, Coco. That's also November. Yeah. So those are the so the, um, let me see here. But uh, I think we basically need about two weekends to kind of really see how. But based on the opening weekend figures, this is looking a lot like Alien Covenant. Maybe. What did I you don't think? know. Now, what did but, you think of Alien Covenant? I liked it. I liked it a lot more than Prometheus. I thought it was much better than Prometheus. So let's see what we have here. Uh, next, uh, next couple weekends... We have Professor Marston in the Wonder Woman. Uh, that's more of a drama. Mm -hmm. The Foreigner with Jackie Chan and Pierce Brosnan. Mm -hmm. Happy Death Day. That's more of like a horror movie. Mm -hmm. October 20th, uh, Boo 2 and Medea. Mm -hmm. Medea Halloween. <laughs> I like reaction there. Geostorm um, with Gerard Butler. Yeah, it doesn't look that good either. Okay, and October 27th is uh, Jigsaw and Suburbicon. And also good by Christopher Robin, I think, is on the 27th, isn't it? Um, let me see. I think that that already got its... Uh... I already saw that one, and that, that was, uh, that's next weekend. Goodbye, Chris. Limited, and it's only a limited release. It's not a major release. Okay, but I think it comes to major theater outlets the end of the month because there's a screening I'm going to for on the 23rd here. So it might come to major cities earlier, but I think it's coming to well, other again, cities. Again, it's, a li it's only a limited release. So it's probably it's still probably going to be a limited release when it gets to uh, your neck of the woods, basically. Maybe, but I've, I've heard real good things about that one. But again... I've seen it. It's good. It's yeah, good. but again, I don't think any competition for this movie is coming out for the next few weeks, so it might pick up. It might have the potential to do as well as they hope. Still, I think uh, it's going to need a lot of it's going to need a lot of luck because normally movies like this are very front loaded, mm -hmm. and it doesn't look like this one's front loaded right now. Mm -hmm. um, and it's and it's probably either going to need ver one very good legs. Or two, it's going to need to do really well overseas to recoup some of this cost. Um, this was a co-production with Alcon mm -hmm. and Sony Pictures, and I think Warner Brothers just served as distributor. Mm -hmm. um, I got to, I, I'm curious. I got to see the movie at Dolby Labs here in Los Angeles. How did you see the movie for the first time? I paid to see it last night. Right. Uh, did you see it in IMAX or what format? Just regular theater. So just regular. And how did it, how did it look? Uh, to you, it looked good. The theater was actually pretty full for the fact of. Right. Was it a? Do you know if it was like digital or three D or what? I'm it curious. It was just digital. It wasn't three okay. D. All right. Cause I saw I I saw it at a Dolby screening room in a in a Dolby format. I do want to see it. Like I would want to see it again, but in IMAX. Would you mm -hmm. Would you want to see it in IMAX at some point? I don't know. I mean, it would be good to see it in IMAX, but I don't know. I mean. I've only seen a handful of films in IMAX, and I don't know if it's always worth it. I mean, yeah. this one probably IMAX would tickets be. can be expensive, too. Yeah, this one probably would be worth to see in IMAX, but I don't know if I'd be willing to pay to see. I don't know if I'd be pay, willing to do okay. that. Like, if, like, I don't know, but it's probably the first film in a while to be worth to see it in IMAX. So probably. All right, so to conclude, Blade Runner 2049, I thought it was a good movie. Mm -hmm. I think it's a, a a movie I think everyone should see at least once and decide yeah. for yourself. Yeah. I think it's worth seeing at least once just because it looks great. 
Um, it's it's fairly well done, but I don't think it's a masterpiece. I think it was a bit yeah. overhyped. I agree. And, you, and your thoughts, Jay? So here's a question before we get into my thoughts. Do you think you need to watch the three animated shorts first to understand this film better, or do you not need to? I don't. I mean. I think it might help a little bit. I don't think you really need to, honestly. Okay, I didn't really watch them, and like so, maybe like it just gives you more backstory about some of the characters. It does. Get, it gives a little more backstory um, for the world, but not really the film itself. I think. Okay. But I think for this film, I think it was good too. I don't know if it'd be a masterpiece either or a classic. I don't know. It is better than the first film, in my opinion. Okay. It really is in a lot of ways, and um, again, I think it is something that like fans of the first one will really enjoy. If you haven't uh -huh. seen the first one, I don't think you'll be that confused by this one. I don't think so, personally, because there are throwbacks, but it's also like just an expansion on it. So I don't know if you'd have to see the first one to see this one. And, and this is the thing, like everyone's opinion, like it doesn't have to be the same. People take, I think sometimes people take their opinions on film today like way too personally. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. not, I mean, not everyone comes from where you come from. Mm -hmm. where I come from. So we're going to see things differently. And I think, and that's fine. You know, we don't have, I think we don't have to agree on every little thing. And I think that's good, isn't it? Yeah, I do. I agree. And um, um, so I would say in, in the end, this is a movie that uh, is worth seeing once. If you want to see it in IMAX, it might actually be worth it. I haven't, but I'd imagine it probably worth, but 3D, I don't think 3D it needs to be seen in. I don't right. think 3D is necessary, but if you were to see it in IMAX, it might be worth the cost of it, I think. But that would kind of be your preference if you want to see it that way and you, and you prefer that uh, format. If you don't, it might even make you a little, you know, it like, may not be for you, but it might be the first one while well worth that. And, um, yeah, I think it'll be a, a film that uh, seeing once be worth it, but multiple times, I don't know. I'm the, reason, the reason I'm interested in the IMAX format is because it was shot in a format where – when you see it in IMAX, it will have a wider, you'll get a wider frame. It'll have a wider aspect ratio. And I like getting to see more of the, more of the image. Yeah. I don't, I don't think it was directly shot with IMAX cameras, but it, uh, like it was shot with the image. So in the IMAX format during parts of it, apparently like you'll see a bigger, like a bigger than normal image, um, mm -hmm. for part, okay. for parts of the film. So that is our take on Blade Runner. I am Jeffrey Harris. You can check out my full review of Blade Runner 2049 and also the recently released American Made uh, at 411mania.com slash movies or 411mania.com. Uh, Jay, where can everyone find you and uh, read some of your reviews? They can find me on uh, the Good Men Project in the Arts and Entertainment section. Um, I've got a lot of TV show reviews in there lately because I'm getting screeners from the new shows on ABC and Deviate Publishing, where I do a lot of trailer reviews for a lot of Right, and, and, uh, and check him out on Facebook. He does great uh, video reviews and updates of, of the Orville, of Inhumans. Um, so those are all big new shows that are on right now. Uh, so, uh, Jay, thank you for joining me today. This was a lot of fun. So Blade Runner 2049 in theaters now. This has been our Blade Runner 2049 spoiler cast on Hollywood Purgatory, where the Hollywood entertainment industry goes to get judged. We're not solving mysteries or rewriting histories, but we're here to take down the entertainment industry. Right, Jay? Yep, yep, that's right. That is right. Thank you, everybody. Have a good weekend.